Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. I see that more and more people are, are joining today's uh, interesting event dedicated on knowledge uh, and innovation and transfer of knowledge and innovation, because uh, that's the very important gap that we need to work on, not reinventing the wheel as we, as we are joking, but uh, sharing how we invented the wheel with, with as many people as possible. So nice to see you. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to host this event today on the International Day of Women. So before we start with anything else, uh, happy International Day of Women. You know, in uh, services, uh, it's a really interesting situation, and I cannot uh, ignore that uh, with the start of this event, but more than 80% of uh, staff in services is actually women. Uh, and when we talk about knowledge, when we talk about management, we always have to remember that there is the gender dimension in that subject, and it's a very important dimension. Uh, also, on the other hand, there is a lot of different situations for women with disabilities when it comes to access of knowledge, when it comes to access of of innovation uh, and our team is working uh, every day with uh, both gender equality and human rights in mind when it comes to tackling all of those challenges and one step closer to that is also today's event uh, because our team full of uh, brave women and uh, brave men uh, have developed really interesting things that we want to share with you uh, and I know it's more or less the cherry on top it's uh, the end in a way of a very long process but it's also the beginning of a very important and long process as well so thank you very much uh, for joining us today on this important date for this important event and now I want to hand over to Zoe to say a bit more practical things <laughs> about today's event thank you very much Zoe for hosting Thank you very much, Maya, for the welcome. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. It's very good to see you all here. So it's Wednesday, it's 2 o'clock. It's time for our Knowledge Cafe. And today we will introduce our Knowledge Hub that we are launching. We're quite excited to share this with you. Um, so just a few technical details before we get started. This webinar is recorded. There is closed captioning available. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We will address them in the Q&A section at the end of the webinar. Um, and I can already tell you uh, the agenda we have planned. So on the menu of this cafe today, um, we'll start with the presentation of our e-learning platform with Sasha, who's our e-learning officer. And then we'll move on with presentations from uh, speakers who have worked with us to develop training courses that are hosted on our platform. So first, Andre will um, talk about his perspective as a, teach as a teacher who uses the, tr the training course on our Knowledge Hub. Then Katri will present how she worked with us to develop a MOOC as part of a project. And finally, Charlie and James will explain to us how they are working with us to transform an in-person training course to an online training course. So that's it. I think I've said pretty much everything I wanted to say. Shall we get started? Sasha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maya and Zoe, for some great introductions. Maya, I honestly had no idea what you were going to say, but I really think that was a really good way into introducing us. So thank you very much. Um, so today I'm here to talk about Knowledge Hub, which is the new e-learning platform. Uh, my name is Sasha Leone, I work at EASPD, and I'm the Knowledge and E-Learning Officer. Before we start about the Knowledge Hub, I just wanted to talk a little bit about e-learning, because it has a terrible reputation. I'm pretty sure most of you, whenever you hear the word, start to fall asleep or think, oh my god, I do not want to have to go do that e-learning. So it's usually because e-learning in the past has been a very, very boring PowerPoint that you have to read through. You could have PowerPoints with uh, horrible voiceovers. I've actually had to do some voiceovers and I've been told I have a very <laughs> lively voice, so hopefully I won't send you to sleep during my presentation today. Uh, there could be terrible art. People can get bored because it's just a recording of a classroom. It could just be like reading a book. You could get lost when you're working through it. There's terrible, out-of-date information. It can be distracting or there's no way to pause a course when you come away from it. So those are some of the main reasons that people hate e-learning. But what I wanna to do today, and it's a big task, so I don't expect you all to fall in love with it, 
but I just want to tell you some interesting facts so you understand how e-learning can be interesting and why it is so important, especially right now. So fact number one, e-learning is the fastest growing market in the education industry. So since the year 2000, it has grown 900%. That is a lot. And you would have noticed most of that was probably in the past two years when it came to COVID, the pandemic, everybody having to learn at home. Uh, if you have children, uh, children had to learn at home instead of going to school. You had to do corporate e-learning online. So probably most of that is just from the past few years. Learning retention rates increase. I don't know how all of you are when you are in a face-to-face -face classroom. Even the best well-intentioned people start daydreaming, drifting off, doodling, desperate to go have a coffee break or cigarette break, and they only take in eight to 10%. But through e-learning, they take in between 25 and 60%. And mostly that's because you get to do it when you wanna do it, you can have a break. By 2025, so what, that's only two, three years away? The massive open online course, MOOC, which is another way of saying e-learning, the market could be worth 25 billion. So because of that, uh, studying has become seamless. Students can access learning materials from any class of their choice, interact with any type of expert and other students, all for free most of the time, especially our courses are for free. And I just wanted to put in perspective how big this is, 25 billion. So with that much money, you could stop deforestation of the Amazon within 10 years. You could relieve almost all world hunger for a year, or you could provide clean drinking water for the entire planet for three years. So I just wanted to put into perspective how big this industry is and it is becoming. E-learning is eco-friendly. So uh, statistics from some universities reveal that producing and providing e-learning courses is eco-friendly. It produces 85% less CO2. Can you imagine how big that is with, you know, eco problems, global warming? I mean, we're seeing it right now with snowing in March. It's happening right now. And this type of learning can reduce those issues. And I think that's probably one of the biggest sellers at the moment. It also, learning with e-learning programs is faster than traditional learning. So in the workplace, it's estimated that only 1% of the work week is dedicated to training and development. And with the industry that we all work in, social services, working in the disability sector, you need to be learning all the time. And only having 1% of that time to be learning is why uh, everything is falling behind, uh, why people are becoming less enthused about their jobs, because they need to be able to learn more to do it. With e-learning, it could be completed about 40 to 60% less time than traditional learning. It also provides employees more fun, convenient and engaging ways to learn. And convenient, I mean, I have done some e-learning when I've been in the bath, <laughs> when I'm laying in my bed, uh, anywhere, all the time. And it just means that people can fit it into their daily lives a lot better. Okay, I actually forgot I put this slide in, but there is a reason. So when people think, I'm going to make an e-learning course, but nobody will use it. Uh, people might think, oh, I, I won't find a course based on what I want to look for. I just wanted to use this as an example from a particular site where you can do an e-learning course based on anything, apparently. For example, 540 people have enrolled in Unicorns and Unicorn Energy Diploma, and they've actually paid £127 for it. People have paid to enroll onto this course. And that, that is insane. So next time you think that you wanna create a course that might be boring, there is gonna be someone out there that is going to do it. Okay, so don't be too scared of it. Also, if anybody is interested in these courses, I can send you the link afterwards. So now that e-learning is in context, and hopefully you understand the importance of it, why it's more important to EASPD, I can start talking about the Knowledge Hub. So the Knowledge Hub, I'm going to briefly touch on what is it, what is available, and how to use it. And we will send you this presentation afterwards as well in case you want to look up anything again and link to the Knowledge Hub. So what is it? 
The Knowledge Hub is the new and improved digital platform for learning. So not just e-learning, but learning in general, where we want to put the learners first. The Hub allows you to access MOOCs and a wide variety of other useful resources focused on the disability sector. So like I said, you can find information about anything anywhere, but here particularly, we want to focus on what we know. So ta-da, I don't know if anyone's seen this yet. This is the homepage of the Knowledge Hub. I think it looks uh, pretty stylish, pretty clean, pretty easy to use. Um, we can't take all the credit. We actually stole the design from the EASPD website that's recently launched. So those people should get some of the credit as well, why it looks so good. What is available on the Knowledge Hub? So we've already discussed e-learning, but we also have resources such as websites, useful tools you can use within your work or to send to people, research and policy papers, a lot of them, are some of our fantastic teams have worked on here, and project information, and many more things. So on the website, like I said, we wanna make it easy to use. When you come onto this page, we have an e-learning spotlight where we put the three most recent or you know, most talked about courses on the front page. So you can see straight away what is new, what you can do as soon as you log in. You can also go and see a list of all of our courses. We have about uh, 10 around about now, and we have a few more coming over the next year. So I'm sure there'll be something for you there that is useful. Similar to the spotlight for e-learning, we have it for the e-library. So some of our more recent or useful resources or any we just really want to show off will be on this front page. So you don't always have to look at all of our resources. You can just see what's brand new. You can also go to the library, the list of all of our resources. And there's a little filter in the top left where you can filter by, uh, you know, buzzwords or the name or anything like that to help you find what you want to find. This is what it looks like when you see a resource. So we try to make it as easy to use as possible. You just have titles, authors, years, a summary, and a link. And we try to make sure we have some nice pictures to go along with it as well. So you're, you know, you're actually happy when you go into it rather than just reading a lot of writing. So how do you use it? When creating EASPD's digital learning platform, we wanted to make it easy to use and as accessible as possible. Considering we work in the disability sector, we have to make sure we cater to as many people as possible so that they can have access to the knowledge. Not everyone is an IT expert, which we've seen just starting this Zoom meeting today. I think every single one of us has had some sort of problem. So, you know, it's not just you, it's all of us. And no one has time to scroll through page after page after page trying to find what they're looking for. We want the knowledge hub to work for you. We want you to just be able to go onto it, click it, find what you need and be done. So when you first go onto the Knowledge Hub, you have this opening page. I thought it was quite striking. We're using our colours. All you have to do is log in or create an account if you don't have one. Once you log in, you have access to the home page where I showed you the spotlight. You have a dashboard which just shows you what you've recently been on. My courses. I think this is pretty cool. So it shows you all the courses you've actually enrolled in and it shows you how much you've completed it. Not a lot of sites will do that, but I think this is really useful because you can then figure out how much more you have to do. You can fit it into your working day or, you know, on your weekend if you're that dedicated and it will make you feel good when you see it's getting to 100%. We also have the e-learning and e-library pages and frequently asked questions for those obvious questions like, why can't I log in? What languages are available? You should be able to find the answers there. Before I move on to the next slide, I just want you to look at the little green man in the bottom right hand corner. He's popped up on quite a lot of the pictures I've shown you today. He'll be on every single page that you go on on the Knowledge Hub. There he is, look at him, all shiny and new and amazing. My colleagues reminded me that this is actually a background from the Teletubbies show. So it was supposed to be this magical, amazing reveal, um, but it's actually the Teletubbies, but I still think it works. So enjoy. And what this does, this is the accessibility menu. So this is great, not just for people with disabilities, but for anyone, absolutely anyone. You can change the contrast. You can make the text bigger. You can have dyslexia friendly font. When you scroll down further, you can change all the colors. You can change it to whatever you need. 
It works on laptops, tablets, phones. So it's completely available for anyone to use how they want to use, uh, which, you know, it's accessible as we can make it. That is all I have to say for now. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope some of you are going to log on to the Knowledge Hub and find it useful in future for yourselves or for colleagues, friends, anyone you think might find it useful. Um, and you can reach out to me or answer questions at the end of this presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sasha. I think it was a great introduction and launch of our brand new Knowledge Hub. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this presentation. As Sasha was saying, you're of course welcome to ask questions in our Q&A session we'll have later towards the end of the webinar. Um, just an indication, we shared the link to the Knowledge Hub in the chat so you can already go and register and everything is accessible for free to anyone, so anyone can access it. Um, now let's move on to Andre's presentation and then jump to Slovakia to uh, get your perspective. Andre, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and soon, as soon as you stop sharing, I will start to share my present. Thank you. Uh, share. Okay. So good afternoon. Uh, I'm very glad that I could uh, participate today on this uh, on this uh, meeting uh, and present. Uh, our online training, online course on called IMAS2 that you can see also on one of the one of the slides in the previous uh, presentation uh, and its implementation to our curricula at uh, our university. Um, so my name is Andrei Botek. I'm from uh, Trnava University in Trnava in uh, Slovakia, uh, Department of Social Work. And uh, we've been one of the partners that have been working on development of this uh, online course, which is called uh, IMAS2. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, IMAS2 is a short form for improving uh, uh, assistance in inclusive education settings. Uh, that was following the IMAS-1, uh, focus on uh, competency, inclusive competencies of learning and support assistance uh, uh, at the especially elementary schools. Uh, we've been one of the five, uh, one of the partners from five countries, which were Austria, Slovakia, uh, Bulgaria, Portugal, and United Kingdom, um, and uh, as well, EASPD, uh, who did uh, also a great job in um, in uh, preparing of this uh, of this course. Um, so as I already mentioned, <clears throat> the main goal was to prepare an online uh, course for uh, uh, learning and support assistance that will uh, develop and strengthen their inclusive competencies. Uh, our uh, course, uh, consists of five web-based knowledge boxes um, on five uh, different topics uh, in the uh, field of uh, education, inclusive education of children with special needs. Uh, and uh, all these knowledge boxes include videos, PowerPoint presentation, quizzes, um, etc. Uh, that should enable and um, easy and quick way for learning uh, and uh, support assistance uh, to improve their knowledge um, in uh, and enhance the inclusive competencies for their for their work uh, after we finish this uh, project we find out that it will be interesting to include uh, this online platform uh, this online online training also for our students social work students, uh, uh, and uh, we started to uh, implement it to our uh, curricula. Um, the five boxes that were created uh, within our project was uh, uh, rights, 
disabled children in uh, education. Uh, like a general introduction uh, to the topic. Uh, and then four knowledge boxes uh, that were uh, focused on. One box on emotions and behavior. So mostly for children with emotional and behavioral problems. Um, another box for interaction and communication. Uh, so focus on, on children with communication problems, like autism and, and some other uh, <clears throat> particularities. Um, another one was for uh, cognition and learning, uh, and the last one for physical and sensory impairment. Uh, as we don't have so much time, I hope that you will take a look on it uh, on the EIS PD uh, platform. Uh, <clears throat> so these five uh, boxes uh, was a major part of uh, our online, online training in the inclusive education subject. Uh, we have, uh, after the first year of trying it uh, fully as, a, as an online course, uh, we also get some feedbacks that uh, I would like to share uh, from our students. Uh, first, uh, maybe I said that there were two possibilities uh, how to use uh, our, learn, our online course. The first one was that uh, the students can use the original video presentation. Uh, made in English and use a scenario that is available in all languages of the partner countries. So Bulgarian, Portuguese, um, English, uh, uh, German, and, uh, and Slovak, or they could do it uh, that they can um, go through the presentation in the language, uh, available languages, which were the languages of the partner countries. And the feedbacks, some students choose the first possibility, some of them the second one, uh, and that's why we will have also uh, some different uh, feedbacks. Uh, so this is how it looks on the on the first page. So you can, uh, when you enter already one of the knowledge boxes, you have a um, short introduction of the of the lecturer, um, and here you can uh, choose. This one here you can choose to start uh, the video presentations in English, or you can go to your, the language that you want to uh, pass the course uh, at. Uh, so choose one of the languages. What were the feedbacks? Uh, there were both positive and uh, negative or, or challenging uh, feedbacks uh, from the students. What was uh, one of the major feedbacks, uh, positive feedbacks, was that the students uh, say that they can manage the time of their learning. It was already mentioned, so they can use where they will go to the course, um, how much they will do in that particular day, um, etc. Uh, <clears throat> another positive was that uh, there was a lot of materials for studying, and they can choose from the different, huge variety of uh, studying materials. Uh, if they want to uh, dive a bit deeper to a particular topic. Uh, they also uh, uh, feel very positively the, the structure of the course um, and a lot of new information for that. Uh, also, what was uh, uh, evaluated very positively was uh, a good and wide variety of examples in different forms, video form, pictures, animation, and etc. Uh, and that uh, led to the, the the last one. It was easy to uh, to understand. Uh, there were also some negatives or or challenges that uh, uh, our students um, posted. Uh, one was that uh, and and that appears um, more times. Uh, was that they were missing the possibility to ask the question. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, the second one, uh, they, uh, there was also in the positives, uh, but it was also mentioned in the negative, that there was too many materials uh, to study. And for some, they perceive it as uh, something what was making it more difficult for them. Uh, <clears throat> then they, uh, in, in more of the more uh, feedbacks 
uh, it appears that they would prefer a, a combined form uh, of, uh, of teaching and they, they will find it more beneficial. Uh, <clears throat> the, the next one was very often connected with the first one that uh, as they have no possibility to ask the question, sometimes it took them longer time to understand the particular topic. So if they got stuck, um, they, they, they find it more difficult to, uh, to continue. And they find out it will be much easier for them if they, if they can immediately uh, co contact uh, the lecturer um, and, uh, and ask the question. Uh, there were also some feedbacks on the on the technical part, um, which I have to say was connected to the change of the of the uh, platform uh, and the and the system. So I think it was really one time problem that that appears at the time, and so it's already solved. Uh, <clears throat> for those who decide that they will go the way. Um, uh, using the English uh, origin of English no, video presentation in English language uh, and use the scenario, uh, especially for those whose uh, uh, English uh, competencies were uh, maybe lower. So they, they prefer to have it in, in, in Slovak. So see the presentation in English and read the scenario. Uh, some of them print the pages. Um, what I have to say that I stress at the beginning that they can use it on, on different platforms. So maybe do it on a computer and, and have the scenario on a tablet. Um, <clears throat> it will be more easier, but this, this is the thing we uh, we will try to uh, find uh, find out um, how to how to work in it. Um, so <clears throat> just to conclude what we find out is, uh, is, is very important, uh, maybe to find, uh, the right combination of, of online training and uh, uh, a room for for face to face uh, part where they can set the questions uh, and so on. Uh, but it, as a whole, I have to say that uh, whole the course was evaluated mostly uh, positively. And um, as our first online course, full online course, uh, I think uh, the the feedback was. Uh, very, very positive. So that's from my side, just to keep the uh, <clears throat> keep the time. And I hope I can make it. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andre, for a nice presentation. We're very happy to see that you and your students are using this course and that you're finding it interesting and useful. I think this is a great example for our participants today to understand um, how the knowledge that can work and get the first insight of um, how we can use it as a teacher or a student. So it is true that the courses we have and that for now hosting on the Knowledge Hub have been developed as part of projects we're collaborating in. And so I'm turning to Katri, our next speaker, who is going to introduce how she has worked with EASPD to develop a massive open online course as part of a project on inclusive education. Katri, the floor is yours. Katri, I think we cannot hear you. See, I told you, everybody has tech issues. Yeah, everybody, no matter how prepared. <laughs> it's now working. Yes, good, good. So thank you, Zoe. And, uh, and can you also please uh, say the, the slides? Yes, thank you. So now you can you can see me and you can hear me. So everything is fine. It's always always like this. But good afternoon for er everyone. I'm I'm Katri Hanninen from KVPS from from Finland, the northern part of part of Europe, and uh, I'm working as a development manager in the in KVPS, the service foundation for people with an intellectual disability. It's an NGO in in Finland, and uh, I have been uh, involved in the in the project, in the Erasmus Plus founded project, the Beyond, or the Inclusive Education and Beyond. And in that project, we made a MOOC with the, with the big support of EASPD. And that's what I'm talking, talking about. I think the process 
can have been quite the same than, than the process with the previous speaker, but I, uh, I will explain you about the process, not, not the training course. So maybe, maybe you can learn something new from this, hope so. So in the beginning, I have to say that, uh, that developing an online course, it's not, not a quick process and not always an easy process, but I, I really think that it's, it's really worth of it. But uh, it have to keep in mind that, uh, that you really have to concentrate and to understand that it's, it's really uh, different than the training course where you can go, go to learn, to teach uh, face to face. It's, it's quite a big, big difference between, between that kind of trainings. But when it's planned carefully and uh, when when the whole uh, project team makes it together, it's it's really a good good process and uh, and also you can learn a lot about making the the training course online. So I really really think that it's a good way way to do. Uh, I don't know if you can see <laughs> it's quite quite little the text I can see it now, but I hope you can you can follow the process. But in in the beginning, it's uh, really important to have the discussion, to have the clear vision about the aim of the online course, and also about the the target group that the, who is going to be the audience, who are going to be the participants, so that it's really clear for all the all the people who are involved in this uh, this process that everyone has the same same idea of the aim of the course. And when we are talking about the, the MOOC, quite a big, big online course, so it's, it may be good also to split it in the different kind of mod modules that it was also in the, in the previous course, so that it's easier to get the, the clear structure for the, for the whole training. I think that we had five modules also, if I don't remember. Uh, it's uh, quite normal, especially in our Erasmus Plus projects, that there's uh, many partners from the different countries. So uh, it's also quite um, important that in the beginning we share the tasks quite carefully and um, so that everyone can use uh, their, their, um, the, sp the specific expertise that they have and so that they have can be also involved in this this kind of planning that what what they would to give to the training course and it's also really uh, important that it's it's clear from the beginning that what's the tasks what's the model that everyone takes care of so that it really becomes to be a good good the whole training course so that it's it's not so uh, separate models so a lot of common discussion is needed that's what i I think that I remember that we 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 did that a lot. <laughs> we had quite a quite a long discussions about it, but I think that it was it was really important. Uh, it's also important to think carefully where to start, so that it, when when you begin as a participant of the training course, when you're beginning and when you move from the module to the other, that you you can have the all the information, all the all the knowledge that is needed. To, to step to the next model. So I think, again, the structure is really, really uh, important. And also uh, to make sure that there's uh, many kind of activities, different, uh, different kind of uh, activities for the participants. As we heard last time, that it can be quite boring if there's only like only videos or only reading or only slideshows or only, only like that. There has to be many, many different kind of ways to learn and also to take care that people can get the, get the information and get the knowledge because there isn't a teacher that you can, you can ask about. And the piloting is a really important part of the training course so that uh, you can get the evaluation and, uh, and you can really see that it works, that after, after going through the whole training course, you can learn the things that is, is the aim of the course. So it's really important and also to, to have time after the evaluation to adapt the training if it's needed, because when you are, when you are planning it, you may not see all the, all the things that has to be changed. So there has to be time also after the piloting. Uh, from the EASPD, we got a lot of help, or actually it was leaded by EASPD, the, um, the lo loading the online course into the, into the MOOC, into the platform, and I think it was a really a big job also. But uh, before the load loading, it was also um, really important that everyone understands what the, um, the idea of the online course, so that the, all the materials are 
able to be in the in the in the MOOC in the platform. So it was really um, really good also to test also um, all the tools. For example, we had some Menti and some Kahoot and, and things like that. So it's really important that we tested them. And then we decided that, okay, we can use that kind of tools in, in, the, in the training course. Uh, in our project, we also uh, translated in, uh, in five different languages. And um, also the translation pro pro process was quite a, quite a big process. And uh, I think that the one, one that we learned <laughs> is that it has to be also really careful with, uh, with the translation so that all the, all the languages and all the sentences are in the, in the right places. We had quite many videos, for example, that it, and it was quite a, quite a difficult process to pay, make sure that it's really, really the line that what they say in English, for example, in Finnish, it's the, it's the right line because there was quite a rare languages like ours. So for the, for the person who loads them into the platform, it's not so easy because you can't handle all the, all the languages that are used. So it's really, really also a big big job but i think it's really um really important so that we can we can use it if it's only in english it's only for the persons who who really can can use that language and it's it's really a different different way uh, after loading the, the materials into the MOOC, I think also uh, important is the testing part and also that it's tested to all the languages, not only like you like, like look overall that everything looks okay, but it really has to be someone who goes through the, the, the training course. And we used our colleagues because we wanted also that there's someone who hasn't been involved in the, in the process so that they really find all the all the mistakes, all the errors, and uh, there was there was also some some of them that we had to correct. But I think when uh, when it will be there quite many years, it's really important that you go through it and you take take care that everything is is right. I think that the best thing in the um, in that kind of uh, MOOC and uh, in the in the knowledge hub is that uh, it's really sustainable and because it's uh, led by the EASBD, you don't need to take care that if it's hidden in some project's web page or something like that because it stays in the EASBD's web page and it can be found after after years. <laughs> let's say so. I don't know how long time they will be there, but but anyway, it's really a good good way of making sure that it. Um, it will be there a long time and many people can find it. And also uh, when we're talking about the marketing, it's easier when it goes for all the EASBD members and of course, of course, all the other European people who are interested in the, in the courses. So I think it's really, really easy to, to market it and you can market all the languages at the same time. And in, in Finland, of course, we can just put the, put the link for the Finnish version and, and people can find it easily. So I think it's really a good, good platform for this. And I have been uh, involved in quite many uh, Erasmus Plus founded projects. And I think that this, this is the, one of the best ways really to, uh, to make sure that everything that we do in, in three years will, uh, will stay in there and uh, will be uh, also accessible for as many, as many people as, as we wish. So that's about the process that that we had in, in the Bion project. And if you have some questions, you maybe can ask them afterwards after, after the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katri, for a nice uh, presentation. I think it's very interesting to see um, the work you've done to develop this work. Um, I, I believe we tend to um, forget how long of a job it is to come up and create such a MOOC. I think we, we tend to believe that the testing period isn't very long, while it's probably the most important phase of the MOOC because we have to ensure it's actually everything is working technically, the content, everything is working for everyone and the translation as well. So thank you for, for this presentation. I think it gives our, our participants a good insight into how to create a MOOC. So now we've discussed how to create an online training course from scratch. But how about when we have to adapt an in-person training course to an online format? There is another challenge there. So now I'm turning to James and Shirley, who will uh, tell us how they're working on this with us 
um, to adapt the European Care Certificate course into a MOOC. James Shirley, the floor is yours. Can you see my screen? All good, thank you, James. Okay, uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. I'm James Churchill uh, from Social Care Training Limited. And just a little introduction to explain to people who don't know what the European Care Certificate is. It's a, a knowledge-based award and uh, it's aimed at entry-level staff, people who are new to the sector, and it's been formally approved at level three on the EQF. Um, and it's a way in which um, workers can show that they have the basic knowledge to work safely in the care sector. So this, the ECC is a common foundation to, of knowledge to deliver care safely in all the uh, services in all the countries. And it's based on uh, the values of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Person with Disabilities. And we have a set of learning outcomes grouped into four area, eight areas. Um, and you can see them all here. So this is highly structured. Um, as a, as a directly taught course, you go through this um, uh, a, a, sec, a sector at a time. And one of the challenges is to get this converted into a MOOC. And the other challenge is to make sure that you've covered everything because at the end of the uh, course of study, you can take the ECC exam in order to get the certificate. And um, as you can see that uh, the pass mark is quite high. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you've got to get 70 plus 70 um, um, in order to pass. And it is possible if you are incredibly stupid to get minus 96 if you've answered all 96 correct questions wrongly. So you can see that's quite a high pass mark. And that's simply because it's such a, a, a basic set of knowledge that if you don't know it, you're really not safe to be employed in the sector. Brussels, uh, EASPD in Brussels has a central uh, register of everyone who's sat the exam and got the certificates. And this is now over eight and a half thousand people. Um, the exam's available in many languages. And when it goes into being a MOOC, it, it also needs to be available in the same number of languages. Um, there's a small charge for taking the exam, but doing it online is far, far cheaper than doing it on a taught course with all the associated costs. So now I'm going to hang, hand over to uh, Shirley, who's going to talk about how we have been trying to take this highly structured course and turn it into uh, a MOOC. Hi, um, I'm uh, Shirley Potter, and um, I've been working uh, developing the training um, across a, a number of projects and for SCT. Um, and when we were faced with um, changing this course, which was a, a detailed uh, written uh, uh, training course that was um, in a universal format initially to deliver across all different countries, covering all of the eight learning outcomes. Um, it seemed quite daunting initially, but you know, when you start to look at it, the learning outcomes remain the same. So we have to find different ways to make sure that we cover all the learning outcomes. Um, and there are ways to consider doing that, but the things that you have to think about are, making sure that you meet all the different learning styles of the people who are going to be accessing the course. It's easy to do that as a delivered course because you're going to deliver in a variety of ways. It'll be PowerPoint, it'll be group work, working in pairs, people having to work on their own. You'll have uh, chatting, uh, flip charts, all sorts of uh, different ways that you can ensure that uh, each individual learning style is met. Now, you need to then think of how you're going to do that to a person who's just sat in front of a computer. And the ways we try to do that, or we've been trying to do that, are to make sure that we do do a mix of presentation, uh, video, 
talking heads, um, activities uh, and reflection activities, as well as research based activities, and then having uh, quizzes and question and answers. And all of these things are um, really aimed to keep uh, to meet those different learning styles. And as well as that, you have to consider how you're going to meet uh, the learner or keep the learner's attention. We all know that when you're delivering a course, it's very easy to see when people are losing interest. And we, as experienced trainers, you develop different ways to change people's focus and attention. It might be walking around the room or changing your position, changing part of your delivery, uh, et cetera. But you can't do that online. So you have to do that with the materials. And um, we've worked to, like I say, uh, mix up the, the different materials and make sure that uh, things like uh, videos are very short and compact so that people aren't, uh, I suppose, bored and disinterested. Um, and we, um, we do have the um, presentations, but we try and include uh, infographics uh, as well as things like the talking heads. And then interjecting with um, activities for the individual to work on uh, and think about. Um, and I think that, you know, that really goes back to, again, meeting all those different learning styles, the visual, the audio, audio the kinetic, et cetera. Um, and because this is a comprehensive course and there's an exam at the end of it, we have to make sure that we don't miss anything out. Uh, and that's um, a harder one because you, you really have to, look at those learning outcomes and make sure that you cover every part of them because you can't, um, if you were delivering a course and you'd missed something out, you could easily um, go back to something at the end or as you're progressing through the course. So you have to be sure you cover everything. And with a course like this that has um, assessment uh, towards the well at the end you can actually sit the ECC exam then you need to um, be considering that as you're taking people through the course and um, making sure that they have got that knowledge and understanding in readiness for when they go and sit the exam um, so you need to think of different ways of doing that. When you're delivering the course, you will be asking questions, asking for feedback. You would be observing. You'd be walking around the room and listening to what's going on. None of those things are there. So you need to do it by introducing some of the things in the activities or uh, exercises such as uh, quizzes, um, having activities where and um, things where they might have to choose the right answer out of a selection of things. Um, and I think one of the other things that we've used because this is health and social care based and it's about people in the workplace, I think it's really important to uh, take it back to the workplace for them. You, it, when you're delivering training, you would use anecdotes uh, and your experience but again it's difficult to do that when you're just you know it's on a screen in front of people so we use scenarios where we give people situations uh, to think about and look at how they would deal with it using the knowledge etc that they've gained um, and then um, the other thing that we've tried to do in preparation for that formal assessment and having to sit the ECC exam is offer people some practice questions as well. Uh, and that way they know the style of question that, that's coming because um, different exams are set in different ways. And although the ECC is a multi-choice exam, uh, the questions are uh, helping people to think carefully about their approach to things. And sometimes people need practice with that. Um, so I think uh, 
in general, if you've got a good course that's written already, a delivered course, it is possible um, to, as long as you consider all of these areas that I've listed, that you can then make that into uh, a really nice online course. That's it. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I think it, it was interesting um, to understand what considerations we have to keep in mind when we adapt an in-person training course to an online course. Um, thank you, James, as well, for presenting the, the ECC. Uh, I believe we tend to forget that when we adapt an in-person training course to an online format, we have to uh, keep in mind the engagement of the, the participants. So it's quite important to keep their engagement and make sure they are still really focus on, on, the, on the course. So it's quite a hard task to, to ensure this, but we have some good tools to make it happen. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers for the presentations. I would like now to open the floor for questions. Should anyone have questions, feel free to raise your hands or just talk. I'm scrolling through my screen and there's many, many faces and names. So I'm trying to make sure I'm targeting anyone. Um, any question, anyone? So far, no. I actually had a question. OK, Renaud. Yes, hello. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Renaud Schor. I work at EHPD with my colleagues, uh, Sasha and uh, Zoe, and I have a question for them. Um, thanks to the great uh, presentations of the of the speakers, I think that we have a good idea of uh, how the Knowledge Hub can be used for e-learning, which is uh, very important for us, uh, developing MOOCs, converting trainings into MOOCs, all of that. Um, the other aspect of the Hub that is very important for us is the e-library. Um, and one aspect that maybe some of our partners, members would like to hear about is how the library can be useful to improve the, the sustainability and the visibility of the outputs of our projects. What happens a lot is that we have a European project, we receive funding for the website for a couple of years, for instance, and then after that, all of the, the outputs that we have worked really hard to develop and are no longer accessible to the target uh, groups. So can the Knowledge Hub help with that? And if yes, how? Thanks. Yes. <laughs> yes, we can. It's a simple answer. So what, like you said, the sustainability uh, of a lot of our projects, a lot of material. Uh, I'm hoping that the Knowledge Hub is around for a long, long time, hopefully longer than I am, unless technology takes over the world. Uh, you never know. Uh, <laughs> but yes, the idea is that uh, a lot of the research papers, a lot of useful information that we that we get in-house at EASPD from all of our members across Europe and across the world, if it's useful and they want people to share it, we want to be able to put it into our library so that anyone can access it. And we hope to keep it there. Uh, when we moved over from the old site to the new site, we did go through a purge where we did get rid of a lot of information from pre-2010, but that's because the laws have changed a lot. A lot has changed in the world since then. Um, so if the information is no longer viable, we'll either uh, get rid of it or update it, work with people to update it so we can try and keep it. But yes, the idea is, is it's sustainable for any kind of information and you should be able to find something on what you want to look for. I hope that kind of answers your question. Thank you, Sasha um, and Renaud. Great question and great answer. Um, I see we have a question in the chat from Bianca, who's asking if there are any e-learning resources and courses that are available for persons with disabilities as service users to understand EU legislation and rights. So we, um, we do have a, a course available at the moment to understand a bit better the disability sector at EU level. However, it's um, not accessible for persons with intellectual disabilities because unfortunately, uh, the, the website as we have at the moment, um, we have to log in uh, to access it and we understand it's a barrier for people with intellectual disabilities to access. So we have this in mind. And so the courses we have at the moment were developed as part of projects uh, in which we worked with um, service providers. So actually the, the training is available now 
are mostly addressed to service providers and professionals and students, but not yet addressed to persons with intellectual disabilities. You're welcome. Sasha? Okay. James? James, you wanted to come in? Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I didn't hear you say James. I just wanted to say to everyone that one of the great things about this knowledge hub is it's free. You're getting all this information in all those different languages, we hope. I mean, obviously, translation is going to be the biggest challenge for everybody. But once you've got it, um, it's all free and for all the workers all over Europe. So it's going to be a fantastic resource. And um, but when you have people whose budgets are stretched as they are at the moment, why would you not use it? So it's, a, it's going to be a really fantastic resource for every employer across Europe in the social care sector. Thank you, James. Indeed, we're quite happy to see that um, many people can seize this opportunity uh, to learn, uh, but we also see it as a collaborative, collaborative tool. It's also a great way for people to, to share their knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Um, any other question, Fabrizio? Yes. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Um, well, really very interesting, and I'm, I'm sure it is important and fundamental uh, for for all of us as service providers, but again, I'm always I'm also a bit afraid about the language, as already maybe pointed out by Bianca. Not uh, for the general uh, items, but if we go a bit deeper into legislation, I think that that could be very difficult because you have to find somebody that translates perfectly the the uh, legislation. <coughs> with the meaning and the, sometimes the philosophy of the country that launched that uh, legislation. So I think uh, we have to find out a balance uh, uh, that the kind of legislation is easy and useful for all of us. And of course, the European legislation can be that, but still, that I think it's a little bit the gap Otherwise, for the remaining part, yes, it is very interesting. Both the MOOC and both the ECC that we, well, we already know uh, quite good things about them. So I think that we have to take care of a bit of that uh, way. Or we put the legislation exactly as it is in the language of the country. We leave it there because it can be useful more for the person of that country because if we go into translation and so on, I think uh, it could be a nightmare. That's just an idea of how I have to translate sometimes legislation uh, for, for my people also in my center from English to Italian or whatever. Uh, it can be a bit difficult, but the contrary, I think much more. <laughs> thank you. And thank you anyhow for uh, for the presentations, really interesting, and I hope to receive to receive the slides because uh, it's good to think in which way we can manage something in our countries already. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you. Um, can I respond to that um, and and agree really how um, important it is that the translation um, is done by people who understand the sector. Uh, I did a project um, in Russia and um, prior to uh, going, the uh, translation had been done by somebody from a, a industry, from a me metal industry of some description. And so the translation we found, there were some gaps where they really hadn't understood the sector, so the translation wasn't quite right. Whereas if they'd have understood health and social care, then I think the translations would have been better. So I think, especially with legislation, yeah, that is important, but just thought that was interesting. Thank you, 
thank you, Shirley and Fabrice. So these are very good comments. I see Sasha that you raised your hand. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, is it? No, I, I totally agree. Yes, I perfectly understand. I, just a little example. In this period, I'm translating from uh, uh, English to Italian uh, items uh, on uh, on work for the project uh, we are running together with uh, with SPD as well. Um, and the translation has been done first from people from another country in Italian, and now I have to check. And believe me, sometimes uh, absolutely all the respect of the people who did that work, but sometimes also in the slang, for instance, the machine uh, um, uh, jam uh, uh, with paper, it has been translated as marmalade, exactly, and not as the fact as what Jay, what <laughs> I see, of course, James laughing quite a lot because you can imagine I found this marmalade into the uh, photocopy uh, machine or something like that. So it can be really very difficult, but also very funny. So again, we have to take care; otherwise, it, 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 it becomes something <laughs> that it doesn't have no more the meaning that it should have. That's it. And so I agree with what uh, Shirley pointed out just a minute ago. Thank you again. Thank you, Fabrizio. That's a, a funny and actually very good point. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Sasha, I see you wanted to, to say something. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, mention that the Knowledge Hub is mainly available in English at the moment. That's because it took us so long to change it from the old one. And I don't know if any of you use the old one, but it was uh, interesting to navigate, in interesting to use. Uh, so during the streamline process, we wanted to make sure it was perfect to use in English. And now the next step of our evolution is to start changing as much as we can into different languages. So we have some courses in different languages. And luckily, a lot of the partners and, and members we work with volunteer their lives <laughs> to help us translate and obviously a, a lot of these partners work in the sector so there's less you know jam marmalade issues the, than you would think um, but at the same time a lot of our we have quite a lot of materials so it can take a long time to translate so you also have to be willing to invest in professional translators as well so right now knowledge hub is available in english we have some courses and resources available in different languages and our main aim for the future is to you know have as many fluent languages as we can on there and i was also trying to find a way to bring in this bit of information and it's a bit odd but i'm trying to make it work for the future i will no longer be working on the knowledge of <laughs> and uh, easpd so i want to introduce our new a knowledge and e-learning officer. I asked her permission before, so she shouldn't be too shocked. Um, so I just wanted to introduce Callie-Anne, who will be taking over uh, when I leave at the end of March. So I'm not sure if you want to say anything, Callie. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you so much to Sasha and Zoe and all the other contributors for such an interesting and informative hour. Um, I've only been in the job five days, so it was definitely as helpful to me as it was everyone else. Um, but yeah, uh, my name is Callie Ann. Uh, as Sasha said, my background is in uh, services for the deaf community and vocational education and training. And now I'll be taking over from Sasha's very capable hands, including the Knowledge Hub as well. So I'm very looking forward to working with some of you and getting to know some of you. And um, yeah, just looking forward to the whole experience. Um, and if there's any questions, please feel free to reach out because I'm officially, I think, in charge of the Knowledge Hub email now as well. So yeah, any questions, uh, feel free. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. It's, it's great to have you and it's sad to, to see such a life, but such a life. Um, so if there is no more questions, I would like to thank everyone for your participation. I would really like to thank speakers for your contribution. I think uh, it's been a great way for us to launch the Knowledge Hub and we look forward to having a great contribution collaboration with you in the future. I think it's it's quite an amazing tool that we have here and we need to really hold on to it and, and feed it with great resources and, and trainings and make the most of it. Um, so yes, I hope you will hold all have a, a lovely afternoon and thank you again very much for being here and have a nice day.